Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of Vax Facts. I'm Denise Johnson, Acting Physician General at the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Today, we're going to be answering your questions on vaccine safety. The COVID-19 vaccines are new, and so it's normal to have questions about them. With so much information and misinformation out there, access to reliable and trusted sources can help you make the best decision for you and your family. Joining me today is Dr. Paul Offit. He's the Chief of Infectious Diseases and Professor of Pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Dr. Offit's credentials are extensive. I am just going to mention a couple of highlights. Dr. Offit has published more than 160 papers in medical and scientific journals in the area of rotavirus-specific immune responses and vaccine safety. He's also the recipient of several prestigious book awards. He is the co-inventor of the rotavirus vaccine, Rotatech, which has been recommended for universal use in infants by the CDC in 2006 and by the World Health Organization in 2013. Dr. Offit has received many international accolades for his work. Just a few notable ones are the Young Investigator Award in Vaccine Development from the Infectious Disease Society of America, the President's Certificate for Outstanding Service from the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics, the Huma Humanitarian of the Year Award from the Biologics Industry Organization, the Edward Jenner Lifetime Achievement Award in Vaccinology, and so many more. We could probably spend a whole hour just listing them. Dr. Alfred has also been a member of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices to the CDC and is currently a member of the FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee and is a founding advisory board member of the Autism Science Foundation and the Foundation for Vaccine Research. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, Dr. Alfred. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. It's my pleasure. Um, so I want to address a couple of things this morning that come up frequently. I think the first is, and this is highlighted by the recent um, full approval or licensure by the Food and Drug Administration for uh, the Pfizer vaccine for those over 16 years of age. Ask, so people ask the question, you know, what's the difference? What's the difference between an emergency use authorization, which is what this vaccine has been distributed under, versus full approval? Um, because many people, there was recently a uh, Kaiser Family Foundation uh, um, uh, um, study trying to ask the question of those who haven't been vaccinated, uh, what percentage are choosing not to be vaccinated because the vaccine hasn't been fully approved yet? And the answer was three out of 10. So in theory, 30% of those who are unvaccinated should now be lining up to get the vaccine. I'm a little skeptical of that. I think that uh, people are just looking for reasons not to get it. And if they don't have that one, they'll come up with another one. But I hope I'm wrong. In any case, so let, let's go through that. What an emergency use authorization technically means is that a company is allowed to distribute a drug or a vaccine as an investigational new product. That's all that means. So, so for example, um, when the previous administration wanted hydroxychloroquine to be distributed under emergency use authorization, it was. It was given uh, emergency use authorization like last April. Um, it was soon found that the hydroxychloroquine neither treated nor prevented uh, COVID-19. And so then emergency use authorization was withdrawn. That sort of event scared people. It, it made people think that the, the, um, the, the, uh, reasons for giving or the, uh, the, the, strict, the strictness of, of, by which these products are being regulated was really lax and that we were just sort of throwing products out there and hoping they worked. But that's not the way it's played out with vaccines. So the, the, vaccine, the vaccine trials that were done, the 30,000 person trial of Moderna, the 44,000 person trial of Pfizer, the 40,000 person trial of, um, of J&J, &J, was the size of any typical pediatric or adult vaccine trial. Similarly, the length of safety follow-up, which is two months after the last dose, is similar for any 
pediatric or adult vaccine, because all the serious side effects that have occurred with vaccines typically occur within six weeks of a dose, have always occurred, frankly, within six weeks of a dose. The really only real difference in terms of the, these vaccine approvals that came last December and, and what would be a more typical, a fully approved vaccine was the length of, of follow-up for efficacy. I mean, when the FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee recommended last December for the approval of these drugs or, uh, uh, through emergency use authorization, we could say that they were effective for a few months, but we didn't know that they were effective for six months, for a year, for two years or three years. On the other hand, in the midst of a pandemic, you're not going to do a two or three or four year study to see how long efficacy lasts. You're going to assume that 95 percent efficacy is um, is going to be uh, going to hold up for at least six months, a year or two years. And certainly we know that that these vaccines, all of them, are sort of in the, the low 90% effective for protection against serious disease now roughly six months or seven months after they've been out there. So um, the, the, the real only real functional difference, frankly, between emergency use authorization and full approval is that the, the FDA, when they fully license a drug, doesn't just license the product, they also license the process by which the product is made and the manufacturing site. And that is usually a lengthy procedure. Um, what, they're, what they need to do is they need to go through every single aspect of manufacture to look at the protocols and validate the protocols for every one of those aspects. Um, typically, that takes about 10 months. If you get an expedited review, that can take six months. In this case, it took about four months. So you, they're, 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 they can now say that the, the manufacturing protocols are in place. But for people who were hesitant to get the vaccine, they should have been reassured by the fact that it's been given to half of the American population. So you have an enormous safety record on which to stand, an enormous uh, uh, efficacy record on which to stand. I mean, even very, very rare side effects like um, you know, um, uh, myocardial inflammation, um, you know, which is, occurs maybe in, in, in as, as frequently as one in 20,000 people, or clotting associated with the J&J &J vaccine, which is close to about one in 500,000 people, um, or Guillain-Barre syndrome, you know, roughly one in 100, 120,000 people. There's very, very rare, rare side effects that have been picked up. And it should be pointed out also that the virus itself does all of those things at a much more frequent level. So a choice not to get a vaccine is not a risk-free choice. It's just a choice to take a different and more serious risk. So I think people should should be uh, have been reassured by all of the data that we had before there ever was a full approval. But now that there's a full approval, hopefully uh, there will be some people who will feel better about getting this vaccine. And I think also importantly, there are now a number of institutions and, and private uh, uh, groups in the or groups in the private sector that are now more comfortable mandating the vaccine. Okay, the second thing I want to talk about is, is VAERS, the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. So I'm going to start at the beginning for, for how, how VAERS was generated and why it was generated. So I think, I think in many ways, the birth of the modern American anti-vaccine movement started on April 19th, 1982. It was associated with a, a one-hour documentary that was released on NBC called DPT vaccine roulette. So DPT stands for diphtheria pertussis tetanus, although technically it really should have been DTP, diphtheria tetanus pertussis. But um, what that movie showed was it showed a series of children, all of whom had similar problems. They were um, they were seizing, they were drooling, they had bicycle helmets all, uh, uh, on, on, they had sort of withered arms and legs, they were staring vacantly up into the sky. And all the parents told the same story. This, this thing that's happened to my child, whether it's a seizure disorder or developmental delay, was all, was all caused by the pertussis or whooping cough vaccine. They were sure of it because the child had been fine, had gotten the vaccine, and now they weren't fine. And that was really, in many ways, the birth of, of the modern American anti-vaccine movement. There was a group that was quickly formed called Dissatisfied Parents Together, or DPT, and they, they soon changed their name to the National Vaccine Information Center, which became the one-stop shop for frankly bad information about vaccines that was enormously influential in, in, in uh, getting people to not vaccinate their, their children. But, but following that, that program, there was a flood of litigation against vaccine makers. Um, and so because of that litigation, the, the vaccine makers were leaving the business. We went from three makers of the oral polio vaccine to one. We went from six makers of the measles vaccine to one. We went from eight manufacturers of the, of the pertussis or whooping cough vaccine to one. And that one that was left literally was threatening to stop making the vaccine because to just defend themselves in the lawsuits, it wasn't worth it to them. 
So we were about to lose vaccines for American children. I mean, we went from 27 vaccine makers in 1955 to 18 by 1980 to four associated with all the litigation that was, was uh, caused by this uh, that program, frankly. So um, the, the Reagan administration basically stood up and created in 1986, the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, which included a number of things. It included the National Vaccine Program Office, the creation of that office. It also included um, something called the Vaccine Safety Data Link, which I'll get to in a second. And it included the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. So the way the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System works is that if your child um, had a problem with the vaccine that you think might have been related to the vaccine, then you basically just fill out a one page form. When it was created, it was actually a physical one page form. Now it can be uh, filled out online and you then submit it to the government and in this program, Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System program that is co-directed by uh, the CDC and the FDA. Um, but it, it's not it's it's, as we say, euphemistically, a noisy system. Anybody can report. You know, uh, parents can report, um, uh, patients can report, doctors can report, nurses can report, personal injury lawyers can report, anybody can report. And it's and, and, and everything gets included. I mean, if you if you um, uh, write a report that says my child got a vaccine and became the Incredible Hulk and you write that in and you will submit that to the program, that will not be deleted. It's all in there. Um, so I think it is at its best a hypothesis generating system because you're missing a critical component. What you're missing is what you have is got a vaccine, had a problem. What you don't have is is didn't get a vaccine and had the same problem. You need to have a control group in order to see whether or not uh, something that seems to be occurring after vaccine is occurring more frequently in a vaccinated versus unvaccinated group. That's the only way you can determine whether or not something really is causally associated with a vaccine. Right. I mean, you know, the rooster crows, the sun comes up, the rooster crows, the sun comes up. Is the rooster causing the sun to come up? No, is the answer to that question. I don't think that study's ever been done, but I'm going to go out on a limb and saying that if you if you made it so the rooster couldn't crow, the sun would still come up. And that's that's what you need. Now, here's where Varus has worked well. In the late 1990s, there was a rotavirus vaccine called RotaShield that was introduced onto the market. It was made by Wyeth. It was distributed to probably about a million people over a 10-month period. And then there were a number of reports uh, to Varus of something called intussusception which is intestinal blockage, which can be severe and occasionally fatal. And so the question was, there was about 15 reports. What was worrisome about those reports is that they were all within a couple of weeks of getting the vaccine. They were all within the, a couple of weeks of getting the first dose of vaccine, which is what you would expect would be the more uh, serious, uh, more likely uh, uh, causal association. And it was occurring in two-month-old and three-month-old children who, who are not typically the ones that get into susception. Into susception is a, a disease of children uh, that occurs primarily in the five to nine-month-old, not the two-month-old. So that was worrisome. So in order to answer the question, was into susception more common in a vaccinated versus unvaccinated group, something that the VAR system cannot answer, that the, the researchers turn to the vaccine safety data link. There you have basically um, a linked computerized medical record system from nine health maintenance organizations that comprises about 10, 12 million Americans, about 500,000 of whom are children. So you can then see whether or not those who got the vaccine were more likely to get an exception than those who didn't. And the answer was yes, they were more likely. And so for that reason, then RotaShield was taken off the market um, in, uh, within a year, frankly, of its being put out there. Another example I think of VAERS working is, is with these uh, current SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. When the mRNA vaccines were given to a million people, then 10 million people, then 100 million people, you saw that there was this very rare uh, re reports or, or reports of a relatively rare phenomenon, um, you know, call uh, this, this uh, myocardial or heart muscle inflammation. And so again, the question was, was that causally associated with the vaccine or was it just coincidentally associated with the vaccine? And when studies were done again, looking at the vaccine safety data link, it was causally associated. Very rare. I mean, it could be as common in, in a certain group of young people as one in 20,000 or more recent studies showed that in, uh, from uh, just looking at the population as a whole, that, that if you look at everybody, it was more closer about one in a million. But it's uh, but it was real. That was a real consequence of the vaccine. 
So, so VARES can be useful as sort of a hypothesis generating mechanism, but it's not a hypothesis testing mechanism. You can't tell from VARES data whether something is causally associated or coincidentally associated, you just can't tell. The only way that can happen is with the vaccine safety data link. So VARES is constantly misused. That, that's the biggest problem. People can look on the VARES website and they'll say, look, look at all these serious side effects that are being reported um, to, you know, following the vaccine, even though we don't, we have no idea whether or not they're causally associated. Probably the worst example, and there was one uh, political pundit who in um, May got on national television and he said there have been 3,300 deaths that have report, been reported following the vaccine, these, these uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. That is more than any other vaccine. Well, so, so take a step back and look at that statement for a second. We know that every day in the United States, roughly two per 100,000 people die. By the time this particular political pundit made that statement, the vaccine had been given to 100 million people. That means by definition that there should have been 2,000 people that would have died within 24 hours of receiving, receiving the vaccine, 4,000 within, 40, within 48 hours unless the vaccine makes you immortal, which it doesn't. It, the vaccine doesn't, it only prevents SARS-CoV-2 infections. It doesn't prevent strokes, heart attacks, deaths from cancer, drowning, car accidents. It doesn't do any of that. So the deaths that are reported uh, have to be at least uh, biologically uh, plausibly associated with getting the vaccine. And when these deaths have been investigated, they haven't been. So again, the when, when you see 3,000 deaths reported within, say, 48 hours of getting a vaccine, it's exactly what you would expect if the vaccine wasn't causing any problems, because that's just the background death rate. I mean, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines don't make you immortal. They only prevent SARS-CoV-2 infections. Probably one of the best examples was Hank Aaron, who was you know a baseball slugger who played for the Atlanta Braves, right? home run champion. He died of a stroke within two weeks of getting a vaccine. And a big deal was made of that. I mean, he was 85 years old, 85 year olds occasionally die from strokes. And that's what happened to him had nothing to do with the vaccine. But we're always sort of confusing these temporal associations with causal associations, um, because temporal associations are mostly powerful things. I'll give you a specific example. Uh, my wife is a general practitioner. Uh, she went into the office on a weekend day and she was helping the nurse give vaccines. Um, while there was a four month old sitting on her mother's lap, while my wife was drawing the vaccine up into the syringe, hadn't given it yet, while she was drawing it up into the syringe, the four month old had a seizure, went on to have a permanent seizure disorder, epilepsy, and was dead of a chronic neurological disease by age five. Now, if my wife had given that vaccine five minutes earlier, I think there are no amount of statistical data in the world that would have convinced that mother of anything other than the vaccine caused, it, right? My child was fine, got a vaccine, had a seizure five minutes later, now then had epilepsy, and now uh, is dead. I am the mother of a vaccine-damaged child, even though that wasn't true. So I think that's, that's, that's I think the, the biggest challenge for vaccines is when they're given to healthy people and they, you know, we have vaccine rates in the 90% range in this country, um, there are always going to be problems and there are always going to be problems that are temporally associated. And I think that's the biggest problem with VAERS is that there are always going to be these temporal associations and the problem is distinguishing temporal associations from causal associations and VAERS can't do that. So VAERS is really not a source of information to determine what are real side effects associated with vaccines. Only the vaccine safety data link or other academic studies can do that. So uh, Dr. Johnson, I'll stop there and take any questions you want me to answer. Great. Well, goodness, you covered a lot of ground there, Dr. Offit. I think I want to go back um, first to, uh, as we talked about the approval, the EUA and the FDA approval. So um, I think what some of the things that we keep hearing from people is that um, they're concerned about how the vaccines were developed. Um, they felt that there were shortcuts in the process. Can you just kind of talk about um, the way these vaccines were developed as opposed to other vaccines and uh, the safety of these vaccines compared to other vaccines that we typically um, have no question about? Right. So here's the way you would typically develop a vaccine. And I would say the average length of time for development of a vaccine is about 15 years. I mean, I was fortunate enough to be part of a team at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia that created the bovine human reassortant rotavirus vaccine, Rotatech. That took 26 years. The, here, in this case, 
Um, the vax, the virus was isolated, SARS-CoV-2 was isolated and sequenced in January of 2020. Um, we had a vaccine 11 months later. There, there were two large clinical trials that were presented to the FDA in December, but those trials have been completed by November. So that's remarkably fast. And I think anybody who reasonable person who looks at that thinks there must have been timelines that were cut, things timelines that were shortened or worse vaccine safety guidelines that were ignored. But let me tell you what the difference was here versus previously. Usually what happens is you do preclinical studies, meaning you do studies in experimental animals like mice or non-human primates to make sure that, that this, this idea that you have, a message RNA vaccine or a, a, a vectored virus vaccine like the J&J vaccine is at least safe in experimental animals. That was done. Um, then you go to phase one trials. Phase one trials are dose ranging studies. So now you have your idea for how you want to do it. Say you have an mRNA vaccine. Do I give it at 10 micrograms? Do I give it at 30 micrograms? Do I give it at 100 micrograms? What dose induces an immune response that I think is going to correlate with protection? Usually those studies involve about 100 people, typically. That was done here. So that wasn't different. What became different was from that point on, normally what you would do is you would go to a phase two study where now you have your dose um, and you have your dosing interval. In this case, let's say for Pfizer was three, three weeks. Then you test it in 400 people, 500 people to make sure you're consistently immunogenic. That was pretty much truncated where you went right to phase three. And phase three is now you get you have your dose, you have your dosing interval, and you do a large clinical trial where you give tens of thousands of people the vaccine, tens of thousands of people get a placebo, meaning salt water, so they they serve as your control, and then you see what happens. Um, that that was done more quickly because basically the government took the risk of vaccine development out of it for most of these pharmaceutical companies. So normally companies go slowly because they're basically making a progressively bigger bet in terms of the amount of money they're spending. And to do a phase three trial costs several hundred million dollars. I mean, the phase three trial for the rotavirus vaccine I was involved in was a 70,000 child prospective placebo controlled 11 country, a four year, $350 million trial. The, obviously the company paid for that. Um, here, for the most part, the government paid for it. So the government took the risk out of it for pharmaceutical companies, and that's what sped it up more than anything else. The so-called Operation Warp Speed, which was a brainchild of, uh, of Peter Marks, uh, who obviously was a fan of Star Trek, um, that, that was, that was uh, what made this so much quicker. Also, when companies make a vaccine, they do phase two, phase three, and then if it looks promising in phase three, then they build a building and then they mass produce. That also was different here. What happened was the minute phase three trials started, vaccines were getting mass produced. E e and and the, the, the government was willing to spend billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars, to say that if this doesn't work, in a phase three trial, we'll just throw away these doses. On the other hand, if it does work, we'll be able to have vaccines the minute we find out that it works. So that's what made it so fast. Basically, the government took the risk out of it for pharmaceutical companies and just moved things along by basically doing mass producing at the same time phase three trials were done. No company would ever do that. Um, Pfizer, to its credit, did this on their own. They, they, uh, the research was not paid for by the federal government. The, the mass production was not paid for by the federal government and the um, and the, um, the phase three trials were also not paid for by the federal government. On the other hand, the product was paid for by the federal government. So they essentially had a guaranteed market. But, um, but I, I don't think people should worry that, that in any sense, safety guidelines were, were truncated because they weren't. I mean, all the safety problems that have occurred with the vaccine occur within six weeks of dose. And that was, I think, where Stephen Hahn, at the, as an FDA commissioner, stood up last year when there was a lot of pressure on him to, to uh, release that vaccine before the November 3rd election. He didn't do that. He said, I want two months of safety data after those two, which then pushed that vaccine to after the November 3rd election so that we could know for a fact that it, it didn't have at least any uncommon side effects. I and mean, we now know post-approval that it has uh, some very, very, very rare side effects, which is true of any medical product. Really, there's not a medical product out there that, that has a positive effect that doesn't have a negative effect. And if something doesn't have a negative effect, it probably never had a positive effect. So it's true of every vaccine. I mean, you know, the oral polio vaccine, Albert Sabin's oral polio vaccine, which we used in this country from the early 1960s up until 2000, was a very rare cause itself of polio. I mean, one out of every 2.4 million doses was, was, uh, was complicated 
by polio. I mean, although we eliminated polio from this country by the late 1970s, every year, uh, six to eight children would get polio from the polio vaccine, which is why we eventually abandoned that by the year 2000 and went back to Jonas Salk and activated polio vaccine. Measles containing vaccine can cause thrombocytopenia, a lowering of the platelet count, which you usually see about two weeks after the dose. Um, and it's usually pretty transient without sequelae, but that certainly does happen. Uh, the squalene adjuvant influenza vaccine that was used primarily in Europe in 2009 was itself a very rare cause of, uh, of uh, narcolepsy occurring in about one in 50,000 people. And these things are only become clear when you vaccinate millions of people. Um, and so um, it should, it's, 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 and also we know that uh, the Guillain-Barre syndrome is a very, very rare uh, consequence of the influenza vaccine occurring occasionally in one per million people. But all of these, for the most part, uh, phenomenon are, are often also seen uh, following the natural infection, which is true here as well. I mean, the the uh, wild type virus, SARS-CoV-2 virus itself causes uh, myocarditis at a much more uh, commonly than than following the vaccine. SARS-CoV-2 virus also causes blood clots, including blood clots in the brain at a, at, at rates uh, several fold higher than occurs with a vaccine. So again, there are no risk free choices, but um, I think that, uh, that we can take solace in the fact that although um, the timelines were shortened here, um, we were able to get a remarkable vaccine in a very short period of time. I mean, I'm, all, I'm on the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee. We were told by Dr. Fauci very early on that if we had at least could have efficacy of 50 percent um, with a lower bound of 30 percent, that that still would be a worthwhile product in the midst of a pandemic. These vaccines, the initial vaccines, after at least a few months of efficacy, had had vaccines efficacy in greater than 90 percent and are remarkably safe and 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 save your life. And so it is very, very, very frustrating for me that there is still a substantial percentage of this population that is choosing not to get a vaccine that not only will save their life, but save the lives of people with whom they come in contact when, when they're uh, infected. Great, Dr. Ovid. I think it, it's really important for people to hear, um, again, how the vaccines were developed and all of the steps that were taken. And I think your comparison with uh, other vaccines and, you know, the incredible safety profile that we've seen with these vaccines that, you know, we've never seen before. And we have experienced, we have, as you said, hundreds of millions of doses of these vaccines that have been given. And we've had an opportunity to see what um, those rare side effects would be. We also, um, I think really important that you've mentioned, um, I think a lot of people forget that um, these side effects that we're seeing and others occur when you get COVID-19. I think there's still some that are unconvinced that how serious COVID-19 can be. And uh, the fact that these side effects are much more common and much more severe if you actually get COVID-19. So I think really important um, that you um, uh, made that uh, um, distinction so that people can you know, get a, a better understanding. Um, one of the other questions I, I wanna ask, I think some of the hesitancy we've seen were around um, reproductive uh, concerns. And uh, as a former OBGYN um, and speaking to a lot of my colleagues, you know, we um, have seen uh, the devastation that occurs when pregnant uh, women um, get COVID-19. And we know that uh, in terms of the mechanism of these vaccines, um, there should be no indication of effect on your future fertility. Can you speak a little bit uh, more about uh, just those, those fertility concerns that come up? Yeah, so, so let me tell you where this uh, false notion was born and why it is that we know it's not true. There was a letter written to something called the European Medicines Agency, or EMA, which is essentially the FDA equivalent in Europe. It was written by two researchers who claimed that the SARS-CoV-2 surface protein, which is the protein that you're making antibodies against when you're vaccinated, was genetically very similar to a protein that sits on the surface of placental cells, a protein called syncytion-1. So that therefore, if you're making an immune response to the SARS-CoV-2 surface or spike protein, you're also inadvertently making an immune response to your own placenta. That was the thinking. Now, in truth, um, those two proteins are distinct. They're immunologically distinct. To say that they have similar sequences is to say that you and I have the same social security number because they both contain the number five. They were distinct. Secondly, there were uh, the second piece of evidence arguing against this was that there were three dozen pregnancies during the phase three trials. 
So remember, the phase three trials are done where, where tens of thousands of people get a vaccine or tens of thousands of people get a placebo. So if there were three dozen pregnancies and this vaccine affects fertility, then you would have expected most, if not all of those pregnancies would have been in the placebo group, right? Because in theory, the vaccine is, 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 uh, is lessening your capacity to be fertile. But in fact, it was equally divided. There were 18 cases of pregnancy, or not cases of pregnancy, there were 18 instances of pregnancy in the vaccine group and 18 instances of pregnancy in the, in the uh, placebo group. So the vaccine didn't enhance or lessen fertility. Also, if you're making the claim that antibodies directed against SARS-CoV-2 surface protein are also negatively affecting your placenta, remember you make antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 protein where you're naturally infected because you're infected with the virus and the virus has sars cov 2 spike protein on it. Well, if that's true, how many people have been infected over the last year and a half? About 100 million in the United States roughly have been infected. Well, th well so if that's the case, then what's happened to the birth rate? I mean, if, if the antibodies directed against SARS-CoV-2 surface protein are, are negatively affecting the placenta, then the birth rate should have gone down dramatically. In fact, it stayed the same. So that's your next piece of information that suggests that this was all nonsense. And although it, this is a probably the most frequently que or asked question I get, it's just nonsense. Unfortunately, it's really hard to unring the bell. It is hard to unscare people. So now I've given you information why this isn't true, but still some people you have this in their head now. I mean, so I'll give you an example of that. There was born in the 1970s the notion that kids would go trick or treating and they would get a candy apple and that the candy apple was found to, in some cases, contain a razor blade. Right. I mean, this that was the, the, the thing that was born razor blade in the candy apple. OK, so so it was completely an urban myth. It never happened. It was it was just utter nonsense. Nonetheless, I think if you know you send your children out trick or treating, they come back with a candy apple from a house that you don't know, but you don't know who, who lives there and your child is about to take a bite into that candy apple. You're nervous. It's just it's just hard to get past these these negative things, it's just hard to unring the bell. And it's very, very frustrating. And that's how the anti-vaccine groups work. They just throw stuff out there. They know that some of it's going to stick. And, um, and, and so and P, it's very easy to scare people. Great. And um, again, as um, we talked about before, um, with COVID-19, um, the side effects, the long-term um, consequences are um, increased and so that you know getting a vaccine is going to decrease those risks i think that the um, women had been concerned about uh, miscarriages and and such with the vaccine and i think that what we've seen is that um uh the risks with covid 19 again is more than your risks um in general and so that i think people lose that um when they're concerned about the vaccine um as you mentioned before the long-term side effects from vaccines have been apparent within a short period of time. And so that I think that we have heard from people, well, I wanna know 10 years down the line what's going to occur. I think that people don't fully understand how vaccines work and the fact that the components of the vaccine are not um, in you for a long period of time. I think that a lot of the questions that we get um, seem that people don't really understand that concept. Yeah, let me, I think the pregnancy issue is, is an important one. What do we know? We know for certain that women who are pregnant that are then infected with this virus are, are several times more likely to suffer severe and occasionally fatal illness, meaning more likely to enter the hospital, more likely to go to the ICU, more likely to be ventilated and more likely to die and more likely to deliver their child prematurely than women who um, are um, uh, pregnant. Uh, I'm sorry, women of the same age who are not pregnant. So we need a vaccine for pregnant women. What's interesting is when the phase three trials were done, they really didn't include pregnant women. There were three dozen pregnancies that happened to occur, but really the, the companies were trying to avoid um, giving the vaccine to pregnant women, which is, is unfortunate because pregnant women uh, certainly were at greater risk and it would have been nice to have, have studied them early on. But what the CDC did, which is unusual because they never do this, is when a, a particular group is not studied, in this case, the pregnant women were not studied, they will make that that vaccine a contraindication for, for giving it in pregnancy because there are no data. They didn't do that here. What they did was they said a woman could reasonably choose to get a vaccine, knowing that the vaccine was likely to be safe and knowing that women who were pregnant were at high risk of getting severe disease. 
And so what happened then through a system called the V-SAFE mechanism is when thousands and then tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands of women did make that choice, you were able then to follow those women who were pregnant who got the vaccine and compare them to women who were pregnant who didn't get the vaccine to see whether or not there were any differences in those two groups, any differences in terms of, of, uh, of maternal complications, any differences in terms of, of fetal outcome. And there were no differences. Um, and, and when that was shown and was then published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the CDC took the next step and said, we recommend this vaccine for pregnant women. So, um, you know, it's the story that I hear the most, frankly, that is the most upsetting because it sort of gets to the question of when people say it's my personal choice whether or not to get a vaccine. A friend of mine called me the other day, and this is not an unusual story, and she said that her son or stepson had chosen not to get a vaccine. He then got COVID. He then transmitted that virus to his wife who was pregnant. She then got COVID. She then, uh, because she was pregnant, ended up going to the uh, hospital, ended up going to the ICU, ended up getting ventilated, and ended up delivering their child severely prematurely. So this man who made a decision not to vaccinate himself also made a decision for his wife and also made a decision for his unborn child. These are not personal decisions. And that, that's sort of the part of this when people make that claim that I find the most upsetting. This is a contagious illness. It is not your right to catch and transmit a potentially fatal virus to somebody else. That is not your personal decision any more than it's your personal decision to run a stop sign at an intersection. Well, thanks, Dr. Offit, for making that point. I think that, um, you know, people are not um, really focused on the fact that, um, as you say, this, this uh, virus can be transmitted to those people who are vulnerable and have impacts that um, we don't even think about. Um, they can be far reaching as well um, in terms of impacting people that are quite a distance away from you. Um, Another thing I want to talk about is that, uh, you know, these vaccines have been very safe, very effective, um, effective in preventing death and hospitalization from COVID. But as we see the, um, the prevalence of the Delta variant, I think that there are a lot of concerns about, you know, how effective is my vaccine? Um, knowing that uh, the Delta seems to be so highly transmissible um, and uh, there are cases where people who have been vaccinated um, can still um, get uh, uh, infected with the virus. Talk about that, um, the differences in the infection when you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, and just generally the fact that we're vaccinated. Talk a little bit about the protection that we still have, even in face of the Delta variant. Right. So the goal of, of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, the COVID vaccine, is to prevent serious illness, the kind of illness that causes you to have to seek medical attention, have to go to the hospital, have to go to the ICU or die. That's the goal. And that, really, frankly, that's the goal of most vaccines. Um, as would be expected over time, the level of neutralizing antibodies in your bloodstream, virus specific antibodies in your bloodstream will decline. That has to happen. In addition, and because of that, there will be a greater incidence over time in asymptomatic infection or mildly symptomatic infection. That's okay. I mean, I think that, that the goal again is to prevent serious illness. Whether it's the first variant that came out of China, the so-called D614G variant, or the second variant that sort of took over the alpha variant, and now the third variant that's taken over the delta variant, in all cases, the vaccine, which is which we have, which were really developed against the first strain, um, still work very well at preventing serious illness. With the Delta variant, it works a little less well against preventing disease, uh, either, either asymptomatic infection or mildly symptomatic infection. But again, that's OK. There was one uh, Republican senator recently, actually, who, uh, who was fully vaccinated. He then contracted uh, SARS-CoV-2 at COVID, and he had mild uh, respiratory symptoms. He had a mild sinusitis, and he correctly said, um, it would have been much worse if I hadn't been vaccinated. That's exactly the right way to look at it. And I think one of the communication errors what we've made, <coughs> excuse me, with this uh, vaccine is by referring to asymptomatic infection or mildly symptomatic infection as a breakthrough illness. That is not a breakthrough infection. A breakthrough infection is when you, are, despite being fully vaccinated, are nonetheless hospitalized. That's a breakthrough infection. And I think we set an expectation for this vaccine that was unrealistic because when people hear the word breakthrough, they think reasonably failure. And it's really not a failure. 
I mean, for example, if you take this outbreak uh, in July in uh, Massachusetts, in Provincetown, Massachusetts, thousands of men get together, s celebrate July 4th. They, they have a, a sort of uh, indoor activities in which many people didn't wear masks. And although 79% of people in that group were vaccinated, there was an outbreak. So 346 people who were fully vaccinated nonetheless developed COVID. So what percentage of them were hospitalized? And the answer was about 1.2%, four of 346 people. That's a vaccine that's continuing to work. And I think so that was the Lambda variant. I'm sorry, that was the Delta variant. That was in July, which is recently. I think we should take heart in those kinds of findings. Great, thanks. Um, again, I think that message really needs to go out that um, the risks that we have right now are for those that are unvaccinated. So we still need to get more people vaccinated for protection. And those people who have already been vaccinated have really good protection. And um, I think that message really needs to resonate with people. People really need to understand that um, getting vaccinated in the first place is one of the best tools that we have um, against COVID. I'm going to pause here and um, uh, bring up a couple of questions that have come through um, in our emails. We sent out a request for questions, and we have a couple of questions here um, that uh, we'd like you to answer, if you could, Dr. Offit. So the first is from a person who says, if my immune system is exposed daily to the virus, and with the help of the vaccine, I'm a able to avoid becoming ill, does that mean that my immune system is getting better at recognizing and battling the virus? Am I continuing to build antibodies after each exposure? Does the immune system use these exposures to get better at recognizing and fighting COVID or is protection based solely on the vaccine? Well, certainly when you're vaccinated, um, you have excellent protection against serious illness. Um, and, and, and to some extent, decent protection against mild or asymptomatic disease. The question is a good one. I mean, if you're, if you're in, a, in a world, and we are in that world now, where the virus is continuing to circulate and you're vaccinated, I mean, is it true that when you come in contact with, say, uh, someone who's, who's infected and you develop, let's say, an asymptomatic infection, so you never knew about it, but, you know, the virus reproduced itself a little bit in your, in your body, not enough to cause disease, but enough to boost your immune system? Yes, I think it probably does boost your immune system over time. Um, so yeah, it's true. It's true for pretty much all diseases. I mean, uh, people worried about that with chickenpox when we basically started to eliminate chickenpox. Would that put people at risk of more commonly of getting shingles, which is a reactivation of a chickenpox infection, because they weren't constantly being boosted um, with just the, the chickenpox virus out there? That did, didn't work out that way. But but you're right. I think that you probably do get boosted. But it's a good thing you're getting vaccinated because. That's the key here. I mean, if we're going to get on top of this pandemic, and we can get on top of this pandemic, we need to vaccinate people who are unvaccinated. You look at us as compared to Canada, which is just across the border there, um, where we have 27 cases per 100,000 people. They have two cases per 100,000 people because they have a much higher vaccination rate in their population. We can get on top of this virus, but we're choosing not to do it. I mean, I am a child of the 1950s. I mean, I watched the development of the polio vaccine. I was a little boy, but I mean, that happened in my lifetime. Polio virus was the enemy. I mean, we created the March of Dimes to, to, to do research, to create vaccines, to get them out there. Polio was the enemy. Polio virus had no friends. That's not true here. SARS-CoV-2 virus has a great many friends, people who prohibit man mask mandates, people who stand up and say, I don't want to get a vaccine, science denialists, vaccine denialists, conspiracy theorists. Those are all friends of SARS-CoV-2 virus. I never thought I would witness something like that in my lifetime in the midst of a pandemic, but here we are. <laughs> Thank you for that, Dr. Offit. So the other question is, um, uh, is an immunocompromised person put at higher risk by another person living in the same household receiving the COVID vaccine? And this is something that we've really heard quite a bit. No, they're put at lower risk. I mean, if you're if you're in the home of somebody who's immune compromised, you want to put a moat around them of people who are vaccinated because that makes it more difficult for the virus to get across that moat into the person who, who who's less able to develop an immune response from a vaccine. This is true for all vaccines. I mean, when when someone's immune compromised in the home, you need to protect them by making sure everyone they come in contact with is vaccinated, assuming they can't be successfully vaccinated. So um, that's your responsibility. 
frankly. I mean, it's very frustrating for me. I was on service last week at a children's hospital in Philadelphia. You know, we saw a number of children who came into our hospital, and, and it was frustrating in two ways. One, if a child was less than 12, you knew that they couldn't be vaccinated, but the parents could be, and often the parents weren't. Also frustrating were the 12 to 17-year-old who came in who also weren't vaccinated but could be vaccinated. So it's just... You know, I, I, there's so many things in medicine we don't know. There's so many things in medicine we can't do. This we know. Specific germs cause specific diseases. You can prevent those germs with a vaccine. And now we have a vaccine. It's just remarkable that we choose to um, ignore it. So um, uh, on that question, uh, I think that there still is some um, misconception uh, that there is something from a vaccinated person that could be transmitted to someone else. And so that, um, can you speak to uh, the vaccine components and um, the fact that uh, you aren't able to get COVID uh, from um, a vaccine and that there is no transmissible elements from someone who is vaccinated? Well, I think there was actually an institution in Florida that, prohi that, that prohibited teachers who had been vaccinated to come into the class because they were scared that somehow they would transmit the virus or something to children who would come in contact with a vaccinated person. So let me tell you why it is that that doesn't make a bit of sense. Whether it's the mRNA vaccines or it's the vectored virus vaccines, they all have the same final pathway, which is messenger RNA, so it's a small piece of genetic material that, that educates your cell on how to make a particular protein. In this case, the messenger RNA for the, for the COVID vaccines is the, is the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So what happens is the mRNA enters the cytoplasm of your cells, which is outside the nucleus, where it proceeds to join 200,000 other small pieces of messenger RNA that are there making a variety of protein and enz proteins and enzymes so that you can live. This is now just another protein that cells are making. Um, the mRNA makes those cells, makes, makes those proteins for a few days and then degrades. But this is how all the proteins in your body are made. So, so the notion that you would catch something from, from this is the same thing as if, if, you know, your body makes insulin every day. Your body makes growth hormone every day. Your body makes hemoglobin every day. It's like, you know, thinking I don't want to stand next to somebody because I might catch their hemoglobin or insulin or growth hormone. It's not going to happen. It just doesn't work that way. So... It is amazing how um, the, the level of myths and misinformation start to reach the level of parity after a while. So the last question, um, you know, uh, with your experience and, um, you know, taking care of pediatric patients, I think that, you know, some of the myths that we've heard is that uh, kids can't get COVID or COVID is not dangerous for kids. Tell us a little bit of what you're seeing um, in terms of kids with COVID. Well, at Children's Hospital Philadelphia, we are experiencing what is happening nationwide, which is we're seeing more and more kids getting uh, getting admitted. I mean, now children make up, you know, something like 14 to 18 percent of, of the cases that are out there. I mean, when when the virus came into this country, the, the mantra which was correct was that you are at greater risk if you're an older person. And that's true. I mean, roughly 93 percent of the deaths were in people who were over 55. But we've we've been pretty good about vaccinating older people. Um, now the cases are in the less than 50 year old. And certainly, although it was true that children get infected less frequently or less severely, that didn't mean they couldn't be infected or they couldn't be infected severely. I mean, there are now, you know, um, um, tens of thousands of children who have been hospitalized. There are at least 400 children who have died of this uh, virus. Children also get a, a phenomenon called MIS-C, multi-system inflammatory disease, which is frightening to watch. It's sort of this multi-system vasculitis, meaning inflammation of the blood vessels caused by this virus. So this virus can cause children to suffer. It can cause them to be hospitalized. It can cause them to die. And we have a COVID ward at our hospital. Um, and if you can prevent that and you can prevent it safely, then prevent it. What really worries me in this is that only about 30 percent of, 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 I think, on a nationwide level of children between 12 and 17 are vaccinated. They are an under vaccinated group for which a vaccine is available. And I don't know what the, the holdup is for parents here. And, and I worry that that same holdup is going to happen when this vaccine becomes available for the five to 12 year old. I hope I'm wrong, but we'll see. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Alfred. I think you've provided us some great insights and um, great depth of knowledge um, on COVID and uh, on vaccines. Um, are there any uh, things that we didn't talk about or any last words that you want to make sure that people really get um, about these vaccines and about COVID? No, I, I think uh, it, we can get out of this pandemic. 
We have our golden ticket out of this pandemic, and that's a vaccine. There, there is no good reason not to get a vaccine, just a lot of bad reasons. So get it. Protect yourself, protect those with whom you come in contact with, and we can end this, and we can go back to life as, as we lived it before this pandemic, but not until that happens. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Offit. And I just want to echo what you said. I, we've got three safe and effective vaccines um, that mi- hundreds of millions of people have gotten. We know that um, they are effective now, even in the face of the Delta variant and the increases in cases that we're seeing, the hospitalizations and even the deaths are of people who are unvaccinated um, when vaccines are available. So. Um, as Dr. Offit said, we do have the power to end this, and um, getting vaccination vaccinated um, is the key. And if you need additional information, we've got information on our website, uh, pa.gov slash COVID or healthpa.gov. Um, lots of information available. Talk to your healthcare provider if you need additional information. And vaccines are freely available all over the Commonwealth. So um, get vaccinated, get the information that you need, and um, let's get out of this pandemic. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Offit. We really appreciate your time and your expertise. My Thank pleasure. you all. <laughs> Thanks.